Hello, and welcome to Science on Screen at Ragtag Cinema. My name is Scott Christensen, and I teach at the College of Business at the University of Missouri. I'm a technologist at heart, and I'm excited about the potential for technology, especially technology such as AI to improve our lives and make the future better for everyone. But I'm also apprehensive about the direction it could take. Now, tonight's film, Coded Bias, is a deep dive into the biases inherent in the algorithms that govern our modern world. Before the film, though, I want to introduce you to machine learning, which is the primary type of artificial intelligence that's used in many different applications, including facial recognition. I also want you to understand why a discussion about this technology is so important and why it's important to be having it now. Why are we just now hearing a lot about AI and machine learning? Computers have been part of our lives for a long time. Well, there are several reasons, but one key reason is that a subfield of AI called machine learning has had some remarkable breakthroughs in the last five to 10 years. Let me put on my lab coat and go down to my workroom and I'll show you an example of why machine learning technology is so exciting and valuable. Let's say that we want to design a phone application to recognize different denominations of U.S. currency. We're going to do this for people that are visually impaired or might be blind, so that they can understand what money they have in their wallet. Now we could go out and we could get these different denominations, perhaps go to the bank and get some crisp new bills, and we could look at each bill, the $1 bill, the $5 bill, the $10 bill, and so on, and we could try to program our computer to recognize the differences. So we would use a programming language and we would program it to recognize the text, the different images, and all the different features of these different currencies. However, what happens when we get out in the quote-unquote real world or out in the field and we see money that is faded or has been crumpled up or has pieces missing? Well, now we got to go back to our office and we've got to reprogram our app to be able to do all those types of use cases. It would take us a very long time to be able to do that. But here's the trick. With machine learning, what we do is we give our computer or application the ability to recognize patterns in visual images. In other words, we give it the ability to program itself. Then our job is relatively simple. What we do is we find lots of different images of $1 bills, and we label those as $1 bills. We find lots of different images of $5 bills, and we label those as $5 bills, and so forth and so on. And then we simply show these images to the computer, and we let it learn what the differences are. And we include bills that have been torn, bills that are faded, uh, all the types of ways we might encounter different denominations of U.S. currency out in the field. And when we can do this with an application, it's really quite magical. Five U.S. dollars. Ten U.S. dollars. One U.S. dollar. One U.S. dollar. One U.S. dollar. Five U.S. dollars. Five U.S. One U.S. dollar. One U.S. dollar. One U.S. dollar. Twenty U.S. So giving the computer the ability to learn on its own, to recognize the differences in images, to essentially program itself is what sets machine learning apart from different ways of programming a computer. Now what's really neat about this is we can take this technology and not only design apps that might recognize currency, but we might recognize other patterns. And if you think about a lot of jobs, a lot of professions, a lot of the core abilities there are related to recognizing patterns. 
So for example, a radiologist is looking at imaging data to try and diagnose different diseases or maladies. Well, those radiologists are now applying this technology so that they can do their job faster and more accurately. Pathologists also recognize patterns of disease. And once again, they're using machine learning algorithms to be able to diagnose things much more quickly so that that information about the diagnosis gets back to the word patient, family, and doctors much more quickly. Cardiologists recognize patterns in EKGs, those electrical signals from our heart, and they're doing some really interesting things with being able to actually determine your blood chemistry based on your EKG patterns. In fact, there's been over 50 machine learning algorithms that have been approved for human use in the U.S. It's pretty remarkable, and it's going to have a great impact, a great positive impact on our lives. So machine learning technology promises to improve and speed up many different fields. And as long as you give the machine learning algorithm good training data, it will work well within the confines of the patterns it has been trained to recognize. This is one of the big differences between humans and machines. Unlike a machine, a machine learning algorithm can't take what it's learned about by recognizing one sort of pattern and easily apply that to another. So if we train our computer only on US dollars, uh, it will not be able to take that knowledge and use it in another use case. Whereas if we were to give a child a 50 Rand note from South Africa, that child would be able to take what it knows about currency and dollars and letters and numbers and apply that when understanding what that new currency is. So the computer's inability to take knowledge learned in one area and transfer that or apply it in another area is a critical difference between machine learning and human learning. And we get into problems when people make the mistake of using a machine learning algorithm in an area for which it's not been trained. We just talked about the example that if we train our machine learning algorithm to recognize U.S. currency, it's going to be really good at recognizing U.S. currency, but do a poor job with other currencies. Likewise, if we were to train our EKG algorithm using EKGs from Asian males, it may not be very good at providing diagnosis for Latino women. Or if we train our machine learning algorithm to recognize the faces of white males, it is going to perform very poorly when trying to recognize faces of African Americans or other ethnicities. Using the machine learning algorithm for a case that it has not been properly trained for is just one way that an algorithm can be biased. Of course, humans are also biased, and we know that many of our biases can be unconscious and very difficult to counter. For example, when people review applications from potential students to attend a college or university, unconscious bias may creep into that decision making. A reviewer might have a positive or negative association with a name, a place, even a certain writing style that may influence their scoring of an application. Now, some universities are trying to get around this human bias by actually introducing machine learning algorithms to help sort through applications. But let's just think about it for a minute. We have a system that we know may already have racial and gender biases. How are we going to obtain a truly unbiased data set to train our algorithm? So instead of creating an impartial system, I'm worried that some of these well-meaning colleges may just be baking bias into a computer-based system. Now let's just step back for a minute and assume that we can have algorithms that are not biased, that work perfectly, they work just as instructed. Does that mean that we should not worry about when and where these algorithms are used? Well, let's take another quick look at how machine learning is being used. This technology can be used to process video and pictures in some interesting ways. For example, it can be used to eliminate artifacts in old films, fill in missing frames, colorize images, 
and they upgrade the films so that they're more vivid and allow us to more easily imagine what it was like to be alive in the 18 and 1900s. While this is certainly a controversial move among some archivists, these enhanced films are very popular and have an appeal that I think we can all understand. While AI may bring the past to life, it can also create things that never happened. Consider this video from three years ago. We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time, even if they would never say those things. So, uh, for instance, they could have me say things like, uh, I don't know, uh, Killmonger was right, or uh, Ben Carson is in the sunken place, or how about this, simply, President Trump is a total and complete dipshit. Now. You see, I would never say these things, at least not in a public address, but someone else would. Someone like Jordan Peele. This is a dangerous time. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the internet. That's a time when we need to rely on trusted news sources. Using off-the-shelf software, it took over 56 hours to render this one minute of video. One minute of video in which you can see distortions, blurred pixels, and other signs that this is a so-called deep fake. In fact, we can use a computer to detect that this is a deep fake. At first glance, you might decide, well, this video is so bad and this application of machine learning is so bad that it may never work. But here is one of the reasons why AI is in the news a lot. It can improve at an exponential rate. And unfortunately, us humans are really bad at comprehending how exponentials work simply because our world doesn't work that way. Now, let me give you an example. Let's say that coming out of COVID, I decided I need to get back in shape. Might be a good idea. So I'm going to start doing some push-ups. And on day one, I do two push-ups. On day two, I do three push-ups. On day three, I do four push-ups. I'm improving about one push-up a day linearly, I'm adding to my push-up capability. So if I keep up this improvement rate, one extra push-up a day, on day 20, I'll be doing 21 push-ups. A challenge, but not impossible. Now let's compare that with an exponential improvement. On day one, I'm doing two push-ups, just like I was before. But on day two, I'm doubling that to four. On day three, I'm doing eight push-ups. And on day four, I'm doing 16. Now for day five, I have to do all the work that I did yesterday, 16 push-ups, plus another 16 push-ups for a total of 32 push-ups. Now if by some miracle, I was able to keep up this improvement rate by doubling the number of push-ups that I can do each day, on day five, I do 32 push-ups. On day 10, I do 1,024 push-ups. On day 15, I'd be doing 32,768 push-ups. And on day 20, I'd be doing 1,048,576 push-ups. And I'm tired just thinking about it. Uh, our world doesn't improve in exponentials, but computers often do. Now think about that Obama deepfake video from three years ago, almost to the day, and the exponential improvement of that technology. Here's what you get. I'm gonna show you some magic. The real thing. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's all the real thing. <laughs> AI and machine learning is seeping and creeping into lots of software applications. From the mundane word processing and email programs that we use on a daily basis to the big information systems that determine who gets the loan and who's a criminal suspect. Now you're going to learn a lot more about bias in computer algorithms and machine learning in this brilliant film, Coded Bias. Perhaps most disturbing is how quickly these technologies are being rushed into use. 
And unfortunately, COVID has only accelerated that trend. I think we need oversight at every level. Yes, we need an FDA for data, but we also need review at the local level so that we know how our data is being used and what we're truly getting into when our company, our organization, our university, or our government adopts a new system or piece of software. I know you're going to enjoy this film, and please keep the discussion going. After the movie, if you want to learn more about AI, you can visit learnabout.ai, where I've assembled recommendations for reading, learning, and experimenting with AI yourself. And please reach out to me if I can be of any help to you, or if you just want to geek out about technology for a little bit. Now, in closing, let me just say how glad I am that you are here. The future is ours to make, and when we come together and learn about the possibilities and engage in discussion with our fellow humans, I know that we can make that a great future for everyone. <laughs>